a poignant song on a sad day for rock and roll fans, Meatloaf has died. He was 74. He's being remembered for big songs like this from the smash hit album Bat Out of Hell, which is one of the best selling albums of all time. Rory Dodd of Port Dover, Ontario, was an important contributor to that mega hit album. In addition to carving out his own career, he is a vocalist with a long list of credits, and Rory is with me now. Rory, thank you for talking to us today. How are you rem remembering Meatloaf today? How do I remember Meatloaf today? Well, it came as a shock when it finally happened, but we were all expecting it soon. Um, it was... Uh, Sad end of a chapter, let me put it that way. Well, let me ask you about the beginning of the chapter, because your name came up early here after we heard about Meatloaf. Can you talk about how you guys first connected? I had I'd gone to New York to do a show called Rockabye Hamlet. It was written by a Canadian, Cliff Chung. Um, quite a shock as far as going from a town of 1300 to New York City. Uh, but he was the first person that spoke to me. It was uh, very odd um, because I was going down there and it, they felt I was taking a job away from somebody. But all I heard was, hey, you. And I looked over and there was this behemoth with a cowboy hat and cowboy boots on. And I said, me? Yeah, come here, you. So I said, oh, hi. He said, I know who you are. And I said, and I know who you are. Let's go have lunch. So we went and had lunch and came back and uh, we're just hanging around he started singing an, uh, an Everly Brothers tune Wake Up Little Susie and I started singing it with him and he turned to me and he said wow nobody sings as high as me and I went well some of us do he said you gotta meet Jimmy you gotta meet Jimmy and I had no idea what he's talking about we're doing a record so the next day he takes me uh, we were ready to sit in a music hall rehearsing takes me upstairs to a 10 by 10 room uh, and I walk in and there's Jim Steinman who sadly we lost last April uh, and they proceeded to play me the complete album, piano open, quite loud, of Bad Out of Hell, just piano voice. And uh, we became friends from that point on immediately. What was that like when you first heard that album and you thought, wow, I'm going to be part of this? Well, I didn't know at that point that I would be. I said in my brain, yeah, you're going to hook your wagon to this. Uh, but it was uh, flattened. I was just pinned against a wall, and I never heard a voice like that before. Uh, and the songs also were just, I just kept shaking my head. I couldn't believe it. It was quite awesome. And so then you did, you did backup vocals for this, you know, one of the best-selling albums of all time. I mean, what was that yeah, like uh, to be doing backup vocals for someone like Meatloaf that with this larger-than-life personality and this big voice? Yeah, well, it was, it was new for all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, played in small clubs uh, around New York trying to get a record deal. Uh, and we finally got one with Cleveland International. Um, quite an experience. It was like only the second time, third time I'd been in the studio. And I'd done another album with Meat for a guy named Ted Nugent. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Yeah. Uh, but uh, to be in the studio with Todd Rundgren, who produced the record, who's phenomenal. Uh, so we basically, he'd meet would be in the control room with Jim, and uh, he would just, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I never heard it like this before. Meat was from Texas. Um, but it was quite the experience, to say the least. I heard so, so much. I know you have lots of stories about Meatloaf. I love the story about <laughs> how, how you met. Hey, you. Uh, can, you share, can you share a couple more? <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, I guess. I don't know. We, we ended up, I, I, uh, this show closed and, um, I was heading back to Canada. I had no idea what I was doing. I was what, 20, 21. And he said, yeah, you can't go. You can't go. I said, me, I, I, I it, it's, that's weird. When you talk to somebody and call them meat, <laughs> that vision that you get in your mind is always, you know, pound of meat. Uh, he said, well, come live with me. And I'm like, Excuse me? Yeah, 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 come, come, come live with me. We can make it happen. And I ended up sleeping on his couch for a year and a half. My back has never been the same. Uh, it, he was quite a character. Larger than life. When you, what you saw with, with meat is what you got. Um, 
What was it like living, uh, sleeping on Meatloaf's couch for a year and a half? What was that experience like? Sore. Um, well, you know, he's a big man and he would sat on that couch. So it sort of went, you know, like this. And like I said, my back was never the same, but it was, you know, having him, meat was meat and he was always, the way you saw him on stage was pretty much the way he was off stage. So it was always a bundle of, you know, roar, roar, come here. Hey, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. And then when we ended up, he had a, a softball team called, of course, Meatloaf uh, in the Broadway show. And he asked me to come out and they all laughed because Rory wants to take a swing with the bat and it was slow pitch. So let's, they're just hit the ball over there. And he was, uh, he was a pitcher. And because I was Canadian, uh, they figured the only place for me was in goal. So uh, <laughs> I ended up being the catcher. Um, that was always fun, you know, and then we did, we did it in Central Park and then he just lived off the park on uh, 74th Street. Uh, so a lot of people came and went. Um, it was pretty exciting when we got the deal. And the first time we heard the song on the radio, it was supposed to be broken by uh, Scott Muni at WNEW, which was the FM station at that point. And I got a, we got a call from Jim screaming, it's on, it's on, it's on. And they, they, somebody had given WPIX, which was a, another station in New York, um, Paradise by the Dashboard Light. And two lamps were broke because he was just jumping around the room and I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Crash. Uh, but that was the first time you hear it on the radio. It's pretty, it knocks you out. Because, you know, I'm just doing the backgrounds. Mom, mom, I'm on the radio kind of thing. So, but it was, uh, it was the beginning. And then we went on the road and the rest is history. We went from playing clubs, like the bottom line. In Toronto, we came up and, and we did uh, the Alma Combo. And it was a live radio broadcast. Uh, and Canada was one of the best things for Bat Out of Hell. They just ate it up. And the next time we came through, uh, it was uh, January, uh, and we did Massey Hall. And we had to drive the next day during the, the storm of 78 mm -hmm. to Buffalo. Now, that was a riot in the car with me. I, I had to drive because it was snow. But uh, there was never a dull moment at all. You just never knew, roar, roar kind of thing. And then he'd call the bass player, Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. Everybody was, you know, he was that kind of friendly. Uh, you didn't want to, well, how can you say, you always wanted to make him happy. How, how, you know? Was he happy about the success in Canada? He obviously knows, knew you were Canadian. What did he think of that? He thought, wow, this country really loves me, really loves us. Yeah, we went to Chum and did an interview uh, and they had this big uh, party for bat going gold. And that was one of the first golds we got. And they had this huge, they had an elephant. Uh, I can't, you know, it's a long time ago, but he was more than, he thought this is the greatest country in the world, Roar. Why'd you leave? Because <laughs> well, he told you to, to right? Because <laughs> you asked me to stay, mate. I, uh, you know, who knows what's going to happen. But it was, it was a trip because it was a year and a half before we got signed. And we actually had the record done because it was originally supposed to be done for Warner Brothers. And, uh, Bearsville Records um, was a, a, a subsidiary of it. And Todd Rundgren had come and we lost the deal, but he paid for the record himself and then got Albert Grossman to sign us. And then he said he couldn't afford us. So now we're off the, off Bearsville and we have to go to LA and we sing in Mo Coff, Mo Coff and God, Mo Austin's office. Uh, he passed. And then Steve Popovich, who had worked at CBS, had moved back to Cleveland, started his own little private label. He came in, it's already in the can, the album, heard a single, obviously, said, let's do it. And, uh, you know, they worked that record hard, hard, showed up everywhere, and we just went out and kicked butt every night. Uh, and it was not a hard sell once people heard us live. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't expecting this fellow in a tuxedo and a white shirt. But what? it worked. It did work. What was the song that worked the most for Meatloaf in terms of what he liked the most? And what was the one that worked the most for you? Uh, well, Meatloaf Paradise mm -hmm. by the Dashboard Light because he got to mess with, with Carla. Um, 
then people that took the house down every time. But my favorite would have been uh, you took the words right out of my mouth because it was like a Phil Spector tribute from Jim, a pay on as it were, and it was just a great hook. And uh, it was unfortunately not released as a single because I think it could have been huge. But that's just me. Uh, it was a pleasure talking with you and uh, reflecting back on this. Uh, Rory, appreciate this very, very much. Well, thank you so much for getting in touch, Andrew. Vocalist and contributor I to Meatloaf's Bat Out of Hell, Rory Dot. <laughs>